just just want to say that it is uh, appreciate Brother Mark inviting me to pinch hit while he is out wherever he is, and I'm <clears throat> I'm sure he is uh, he is somewhere uh, doing something wonderful, <laughs> and so. But uh, we we love Brother Mark, and it's it's great to say uh, to see Brother Tim here tonight, and uh, of course Miss Lisa, and of course Miss Shirley always. And Miss Shirley, we're we're still praying for you that you'll, you know, that you'll get your son-in-law straightened out before you. <laughs> oh man, but it is great to see you guys here. <clears throat> now I do appreciate Brother Mark uh, and his family very much, and so I just want to uh, say that, make that clear. Brother Mark has been wonderful. Brother Tim was wonderful, and Brother Bobby was wonderful, and. Now we've got another wonderful pastor, and so all of our pastors have been fantastic. And they've all been great preachers. Brother Bobby was a great preacher, Brother Tim was a great preacher, and Brother Mark is a great preacher. And so that is, is fantastic, and we love Broadway Baptist Church. Brother Mark, <clears throat> we love Brother Mark and his family. Uh, Brother Mark, of course, believes the Word of God. Uh, you know, he's, he's hardline. And that's, that's what I like, you know, man, he's solid on the word, believes, believes the book. And uh, he's a very good preacher, too. Again, all of our, my pastors here have been uh, great preachers. We've been here about 30 years or more. And uh, they've all been wonderful preachers. And Brother Mark is a great preacher as well. And his wife, Amanda, is from my wonderful hometown of Lexington, Tennessee, that metropolis of Lexington, Tennessee, and so she is, she is from, from there, and those are some of my family from uh, growing up uh, from years ago. And you know, one thing about Brother Mark that I enjoy is, you know, he's really funny. You know, Brother Mark is hilarious. Uh, I tell you, last Wednesday night when we were going through the, uh, you know, going through Revelation, we just kind of laughed our way through the whole through the whole evening, and I think that is, is fantastic, you know. We Christians ought to have a good time. We ought to be joyous and have fun, even when we're studying serious, serious things. And you know, I've known Brother Mark for a, a long time. Brother Mark was a student there at Mid-America, and so I was uh, his professor um, in classes, and he just uh, did fantastic. Uh, uh, Brother Mark uh, also was the MC at the wedding for my youngest daughter, uh, the rehearsal dinner, and uh, he did, of course, a great job there. And then back in, uh, back in 1998, we went to Israel together. And so I'll see if this will come up. If it... Well, Brother Mark is a picture of Mark. And so, but, you know, it'll, there it comes. Okay. So if you can see, see that, this real young guy right over there, top right, that's Brother Mark back in 1998 when we were in Israel. And also, this fella sort of in the middle, in the center, is Jason Mackey, who also works here at the school. And, of course, Paul and my parents were there, too. We were down in the front row. But, uh, <clears throat> but Brother Mark and uh, Brother Jason went with us. We had a fantastic time. And, of course, where, where we are is uh, we're on the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> and so we're sitting on the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> Behind us is, of course, the Eastern Gate, the Golden Gate, that leads into the city of Jerusalem. And Ezekiel the prophet says that when Christ returns, and we're talking about Christ's return here with Revelation and Daniel and all these books, but when Christ returns, he's going to go through that gate. And so he will enter the city and begin to rule. He'll go right through that gate. It's blocked up now, but Christ will go right through it, so it will be no problem for him. And, of course, you can see just sort of just barely uh, there in the corner, <clears throat> On top, just over the fence, the Dome of the Rock, 
And that's where Solomon's temple stood and where Herod's temple stood and where someday there'll be a new temple there and Christ will rule and reign from that, from that place. Here is another picture. Let's see if it'll switch. We got another picture of Brother Mark here and I'm aiming it over here to switch in a minute. But <clears throat> it, will, it will turn. There it goes. Okay. And so here, we're at Caiaphas' house. Caiaphas, of course, was the high priest. And in the courtyard is where Peter denied Christ those three times. So this is the, the, the house. And down below Caiaphas' house, he was the high priest. So he was a religious leader but he was also a political leader. And so under his house, he had a, a, a dungeon, a prison. And so this dungeon, and you can see underneath there, it's a lot more to it, but there would be places where people would be put in stocks and, and so forth, as I remember. But down in this dungeon where we're standing, that's Brother Mark with his, kind of his back to us, but this is where Christ spent his, his hours, his last hours, waiting to go to Pilate and be crucified. So that's one of the holiest sites to me in all of Israel. So that is Brother Mark. And so uh, anyway, we had a great time. And we are looking to go to Israel next summer. Uh, Brother Mark and I are planning to, to take a group. And so when that's finalized, Brother Mark will be sharing that with you, I'm sure. All right, thank you, there you go. Now, <clears throat> I want to uh, say that uh, I really have enjoyed uh, Brother Mark's series on the Bible and culture. You know, that was very good. He really nailed what, what is going on in our world and in our country. Uh, some of that was a little bit uncomfortable, I think, but things that we needed to be aware of. Brother Mark has asked me to share tonight a bit about the prophet Daniel and the book of Revelation. Now, I've written a couple of commentaries on the book of Revelation, and I was a translator for the CSB translation for Daniel, and I've done other things in that book, and I've taught it a zillion times at the seminary over the years that I've been there, but I also love the uh, book of Revelation. Uh, the book of Revelation, I haven't been able to teach at the seminary because I'm an Old Testament Hebrew professor, and they won't let me out of my box. You know, they make me stay in Old Testament and Hebrew, but I, I'd love to teach Revelation at the seminary as well. But I have taught it a number of times in churches where I was pastor and churches where I've been interim pastor. And so, great book. I love it, and Brother Mark has started teaching that, and it's got me fired up about it, and <clears throat> the uh, people at uh, <clears throat> the church where I'm interim pastor right now, some of them, I think, have been wanting me to, to teach Revelation, so I think, you know, this is getting me fired up, and I believe the Lord, uh, I'm going to pray about it, but I believe the Lord would have me do, uh, do that, so I probably will start preaching Revelation where I am till they till they find a, a real preacher, you know, and replace me, you know, <laughs> there. All right. Well, uh, Brother Mark is, uh, has wanted me to talk about Daniel and Revelation and how they connect. I love both of these books, so I'm happy to do that for you, uh, for you tonight. Now, Brother Mark is going to give, uh, he said, an overview of the the views on prophecy, I think he said next week. And so next week or the week after that, and I would just mention that way back in 2015, 100 years ago, Brother Tim asked me to do a series on the Bible in the future. And so I did that one summer, one July there in, in the church. And uh, so the, the first session that I did was on the, the, the Bible <clears throat> and the, uh, the, the different views, uh, the different end times views, the different views of eschatology. 
And so I went through the amillennial view and the premillennial view and the postmillennial view and the preterist view and all of those views and gave arguments for them and arguments against them. And of course, I agree with Brother Mark that the premillennial view is the, uh, is the best view. And, and, uh, but, but I do deal with all of those. So if they still have those around, they made videos uh, out of them. So if they still have that around, that may be a good supplement uh, to uh, B Brother Mark's study. And then also, one of the sessions that I did was on Revelation 13 and 17. And so Brother Mark, I know, will do more detail than what I did uh, there. But uh, that may be a, something that might be helpful as you study the book of Revelation. Also, in that Revelation session that I did, I, I gave a, just a brief overview of the different rapture views. You know, the post-trib view, the pre-trib view, mid-trib view, and the pre-wrath view. So I talked a little bit about them and arguments for and against those different views. So, if they still have those videos around, you might want to get one that may be helpful, again, to supplement. Brother Mark's going to be doing a lot more detail, but to supplement the study. Now, you know, Brother Mark is, is absolutely right that the book of Revelation frightens some people, and some pastors are uncomfortable with it because, you know, there's so many views, and good people hold different views, and so really it can get very uh, confusing. Some people think... Well, you know, if, if this professor who I respect and that professor who I respect or this Bible scholar or this prophecy expert, if, if this guy's saying one thing and another saying another, then, you know, how in the world can I understand it if, if they can't even agree, uh, agree on it? And so the easiest thing for some people to do is just to ignore it. But I don't think we need to do that. And I think even though there are details in the book of Revelation and Daniel that you know, we can disagree over. The, the, the big picture in both of those books is crystal clear. And so I think you'll see that as you get into the study with Brother Mark. Now, I do realize that to some people, the book of Revelation is scary. And, you know, I, I get it. There's some, you know, some things in there that seem kind, kind of scary, but remember that the Apostle Paul, when he was talking about Christ's coming, he said, he, he talked about Christ's coming, and at the end of that, he said, now frighten one another to death with these words. <laughs> now, is that what he said? No, he said, comfort one another with these, these words, that Christ is going to come. The dead will rise in Christ first. Those of us who remain, who are alive, will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words, not scare people to death with, with these words. Listen, for the lost world, Christ's coming is going to be the most frightening day in human life. History next to the great white throne judgment, which Revelation describes over in Revelation chapter, chapter 20. But for believers, it's going to be one of the most glorious days in all, all of uh, history. And so we need to understand that the judgments of Revelation and Daniel are intended to punish the wicked and to deliver the saints from an evil world system, an evil world power which is going to be existing in the last days. And you know, I would point out that the real hallelujah chorus is in Revelation chapter 19. And in Revelation chapter 19, the saints shout hallelujah four times. And they shout hallelujah because Christ is judging their persecutors. He is judging the evil world system, this evil world ruler who's going to exist in the last days. And he is coming to deliver, to deliver them. And so I believe that uh, this last days evil world system is going to be controlled by a very evil person. And Daniel and Revelation both talk a lot 
about him. So really, when you look at Revelation, when you look at Daniel, when you look at these things, remember, the point is Christ is coming and he is coming to deliver you. He's coming to deliver his people. So it is a good thing. It is not. It is not a bad thing. It's not a scary thing. Second, you know, some people think that Revelation and Daniel are sort of incomprehensible. You know, that nobody in the world can understand the, these books. You know, God has given us a book that no human person who's ever lived can understand. <laughs> That's just absolutely not true. As Brother Mark said last week, that much of the symbolism in the book is, is interpreted in the book itself or by other scriptures. And we'll, we'll see that tonight as we look at some of these things. But, but we don't have to wonder about most of what Daniel and Revelation are teaching because the book tells us what they are talking about. Somebody used to ask, uh, Dr. Rogers used to say that when people would ask him, uh, how do we interpret the book of Revelation? The book of Daniel would be the same. Do we interpret it symbolically or literally? And he said, I would always answer, yes. Because see, what we do, we find out what that symbol represents, and then we literally, we literally believe it. So that's, that's what we're going to be, that's what we're going to be doing. All right. I've got 20-something pages here, so I've <laughs> I got to move on and skip some stuff. Okay. Now let's talk about the books of Daniel and Revelation. The first thing, let me just tell you quickly, what's in the book of Daniel? Who, who wrote that book? When, when did he live? Well, the events in the book of Daniel took place from 605 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, conquered Jerusalem and Egypt, conquered the whole area, and he took Daniel and his friends to Babylon into captivity. And Daniel lived in Babylon for the next 70 years. And he was there when Cyrus the Persian conquered, uh, conquered Babylon. And Daniel even served in the Persian government for, for a while. But uh, he died probably about 535 B.C. And what we have in the book, the first six chapters of the book of Daniel record the history of Daniel. Uh, his being taken to Babylon, the fiery furnace uh, episode, Daniel and the lion's den. So th those accounts are recorded. The handwriting on the wall, all of that is in the first six chapters. In the last six chapters, chapters 7 through 12, we see four great visions that Daniel received from the Lord. And it's, it's in that section, that's more the apocalyptic section, in that section, you see more of the overlap between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Of course, Revelation written by the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos, uh, most scholars believe during the time of Domitian, so about 90 or the early 90s is when Daniel was there. And in the book, of course, uh, Brother Mark shared with us Revelation 119. The book outlines itself Dan, uh, Rep, John was to record the things that he saw there in that vision in chapter 1 and then the things that are the seven churches and which existed in that day, real churches and then the things that would be thereafter and so the future and the future will include the wrath of God judgments upon the world also that Christ coming and the wonderful new world to follow when Christ Come. So that, that's what we have in those two books. Now, how do they compare here? Thank you for changing that. The, the first thing I want you to see, uh, uh, first parallel between the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation is this. Both of them were Jewish authors, of course, and Daniel and Revelation both lived in a foreign country. They lived in a foreign country. Neither one of them lived in Israel when they wrote their books. They were in a foreign country. Daniel lived in Babylon, which is modern day Iraq. You know, it's very interesting that so many Bible persons and events took place 
in the country of Iraq. The Garden of Eden may have been in Iraq. The Tower of Babel was definitely in Iraq. Abraham lived in Iraq. Daniel and Ezekiel were Iraqis, so they lived in, in what is now modern-day Iraq. And then the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation on that Greek island of, of Patmos, but, but his home was in Ephesus, Turkey. The latter years of his life he spent in Ephesus, so his home was in Turkey. That's where he was living when he was exiled 60 miles off the coast of Turkey to this, uh, to this little devil's island, so to speak. And so uh, the Apostle John lived in Turkey. And what's interesting is that the cradle for much of Christianity was in Turkey. The Apostle Paul lived in Turkey. The seven churches of Revelation, all of them in Turkey. Many of the letters that Paul writes are to churches that are in that area. And sadly, today in Iraq and Turkey, there really aren't that many Christians. And many, many Christians have left Iraq over the turmoil of the last uh, 20 years or so with ISIS and the wars and all, all of that. Now, the second thing that we see here is Revelation and Daniel are both prophetic books. As Brother Mark pointed out last week, the book of Revelation specifically calls itself a prophecy in verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And so six times in the book, Daniel or John calls his book a prophecy. Of course, Daniel is one of the four major Old Testament prophets, and Jesus himself... Jesus spoke of Daniel the prophet in Matthew 24 and verse 15. So both of those are prophetic books. Then third, Revelation and Daniel are both apocalyptic books. Now, some people think that apocalyptic is virtually a synonym for uh, fiction. <laughs> but but it's, it's not a synonym for fiction. Uh, uh, the, uh, the term apocalyptic, and some people think that it just simply means that we can get some general principles, but, but really not much specific, so we don't need to spend much time on Daniel or Revelation. However, the two apocalyptics in the book, in the Bible, are Daniel and Revelation. Only two books that are really, uh, I think, bona fide apocalyptic works. Both of these books tell us that God is going to win, which is wonderful, but they tell us a whole lot more than, than that. And so we need to take these books very seriously. Now, Brother Mark mentioned last week where we get the name Apocalypse. It's the first word there in the book of Revelation, Revelation of Jesus Christ. That word revelation is apocalypsis. It means to reveal, to unveil, to uncover. And so that's where we get that term. So these books are books, apocalyptic books, are books that reveal things. They reveal Christ, and they re reveal things about Christ, God. They reveal things about the future as well. And we see uh, much about Christ and the future in Daniel and the book of Revelation. Now, Daniel is the classic Old Testament apocalypse and the first truly apocalyptic Bible book. Revelation is the classic New Testament apocalypse and it's the book where we get the name, we get the name Apocalypse from the book of Revelation. Now, uh, you say, well, what is an apocaly apocalyptic book like? Well, there are a number of characteristics, at least eight, characteristics of apocalyptic books. Number one, an apocalyptic, apocalyptic book is first a revelation from God. So an apocalypse is a revelation from God. It is an unveiling. It is a revealing from God. God is revealing some things to us. Second, it is revealed, it's a revelation through a mediator. The mediator may be an angel, the mediator may be Christ himself. 
And in both Daniel and Revelation, Christ reveals things, angels reveal things. So you see both. And it's revealed a revelation through a mediator to a messenger. The messenger in Revelation is John the Apostle. In Daniel, it is the prophet Daniel. And it is a revelation about future things. In Revelation, it says the things that must soon take place, things in the future, things that have not occurred as yet. In the book of Daniel, Daniel says in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 4, he's told, but you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, that is, preserve this book, until the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So Daniel is specifically told to preserve the book of Daniel for those people in the end times who are going to need it because it is revealing things about the future that people will need to know when these things begin to happen. And then five, an apocalyptic book comes from a time of persecution or historical crisis. The apostle John was in exile for his testimony for Jesus Christ there on the Isle of Patmos. Irenaeus said that John was exiled during the time, during the reign of Domitian, this very evil Roman emperor. And he launched a persecution that was a, a wide, widespread. And so it was a time of persecution. It was a, a time of crisis. Daniel was a captive in Babylon and during his lifetime, the Jewish nation was conquered by the Babylonians. It was completely destroyed. The city leveled, the Solomon's temple was leveled and the nation of Israel ceased to exist. And so for the exilic period, there was no Israel. Israel was gone. And so you can see how frightened and how disconcerting that was to the people of God. Time seemed bleak to God's people. During these times, God stepped up. He did miraculous things and God revealed some things to Daniel and to Revelation. And what he delivered was a message of hope through Daniel and through John. These apocalyptic books have a message of hope for us today. And what they say is that Christ is coming. Uh, nothing's gonna take him by surprise and he's gonna come and deliver his people. So that's, that's good news. And then six, the, an apocalyptic book, the message is presented in dreams or visions. John sees several visions, and in the book of Daniel, Daniel receive, interprets dreams, but also has four great visions in chapter seven through 12. And then in Daniel and Revelation, there's much use of symbolism and numerology. Now, symbolism and numerology, not the bad kind, not the cultic kind that Brother Mark was talking about last Wednesday night, but both Daniel and John speak of beasts coming out of the sea. Now, these aren't real beasts. These beasts are symbols for something. The sea is a symbol for something. And we're told in both books, Daniel and Revelation, what those symbols represent. So we don't, we don't have to, 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 to guess, but he uses symbols to convey the message. And also numbers, are, some numbers are given special significance. In Revelation, there are seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowl judgments. So the number seven has special significance there. And then the eighth, um, uh, the eighth uh, characteristic of apocalyptic is, <clears throat> now I better look at my time here. Uh, for, <laughs> yeah, okay. We will get through on time for the choir. Okay, but uh, <clears throat> the, the major theme of, a, of an apocalyptic book is the eschatological, that is, end times triumph of the kingdom of God. We see that in Daniel chapter 2, 44, and Revelation chapter 19. In Daniel 2, the scripture says, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another. 
to another people. It shall break in pieces all of the kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. So the kingdom of God is going to come. And then in Revelation chapter 19, Christ comes at the end, chapter 19. He is King of kings, Lord of lords. He sets up a kingdom that will never end. Now, a fourth parallel that we see is that Daniel and Revelation both emphasize the absolute sovereignty of God. The absolute sovereignty of God. Virtually every page of the book of Daniel, you see that God is sovereign. He sets up kings, he puts them down. In the book of Revelation, you see exactly the same thing. God is sovereign. He is the Lord, the mighty, the mighty God in the book. And he is called the Lord God, the Almighty. When, you, when we first start looking at Revelation, that visionary part, you see in chapter 4, God is on the throne. Now, Domitian was on the throne, throne of Rome, but God was on heaven's throne. And so he really was in control. He was sovereign. Then number five, both Daniel and Revelation emphasize God's love for his people. God's people are in crisis mode, but Christ was there with them. In Revelation, Christ was on Patmos with John, and John wasn't alone. Christ stands in the midst of his lampstands, showing that he's with his people. They represent the churches. Christ is saying, I'm with you. I know what you're going through. I'm going to get you through this. In the book of Daniel, God is with Daniel in Babylon, just as he was back there in Jerusalem. We see Christ with those three Hebrews, those three friends of Daniel in the fiery furnace. We see Christ in the lion's den with Daniel. So Christ is there in these books. He is with he is with them. And then number seven, both Daniel and Revelation emphasize eschatology. That is end times prophecy. End times prophecy. Now I know you can say, well, uh, you know, thank you for sharing that, Captain Obvious, you know, because we know Daniel and, and Revelation both are going to speak of the future. You know, both of we all are aware of that. But I want to emphasize that end times prophecy is a prominent theme in these books and, um, uh, and, and very important. And that's why many people are interested in studying the books of Daniel and Revelation. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to study these books that teach about the end, the end times. You know, some people seem to say, well, we need to focus on the here and now and not, you know, be looking at all the time to the future and Christ's second coming and all of that. But, you know, I would say that if you really keep in mind that Jesus might come tonight, you're probably going to focus more on the here and now. You know, you're probably going to do better. You're going to live righteously and do better than you would if, if you don't focus on the fact that Jesus Christ could come before we're dismissed tonight. And so if we believe that, I help, think it's going to help us to live right. So we need to remember Christ is coming. We need to, to live as if he could come any moment. And Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 24, verses 42 through 44, that we should be watching. What are we to be watching? We're to be watching for the signs that he had just given. In Matthew chapter 24, and the Bible tells us to keep watch and watch for these signs else elsewhere. Some people say, well, you know, Christ is going to come like a thief in the night. Nobody knows when a thief in the night is going to come. So why should we be watching? Well, you know, they haven't read that whole passage if they say that, because here's what it says. Paul said, now concerning the times and the seasons, that is the things that are going to be taking place in the end times, Paul said, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. Now, why not? Because Paul shared those signs and those things to be looking for when he was with them, when he was there teaching them personally. So he said, I don't have to write you about those. I've already shared those with you. Things to be looking for, signs of the end. He says, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord, coming of Christ, 
will come like a thief in the night. So you say, okay, it's a thief in the night. Nobody knows when a thief in the night is going to come, so why, why look? <clears throat> he says, while people are saying there is peace and safety or security, then sudden destruction will come upon them like labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. So Christ is coming like a thief in the night. Nobody knows when that is. So why be looking for signs and studying prophecy and all this? But see, we don't want to stop there with verse 3. Go to verse 4. Listen to what it says. But you, brothers, you are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then let us not sleep or as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. That is, we are to be watching. Listen, for a lost world, Christ coming and all these things that Revelation describes is, gonna, is going to be an absolute shock to them. They're not going to know what hit them. But, but for Christ's people... We, we, should be, uh, we should be ready. We should be preparing. We should be warning our lost friends and neighbors when we see these things happening because we know that it is getting near. Now look, Jesus said nobody knows the exact day or hour. We don't know that. I don't know if Jesus is coming at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning. We, nobody can make predictions uh, like that. And most of these people I think are just... You know, they're uh, well-meaning uh, people who make all these predictions. They're just wrong. They shouldn't, shouldn't do it. But we can see the, the signs, the seasons. We can tell that we're getting near. Certain things are happening that the Scripture indicate would be happening in the last days. And so we can say, you know, things are getting near, so we need to be looking for the return of Christ. And then eight. Both Daniel and Revelation focus on the Jewish people and the nation of Israel. You know, it's, it's interesting here that uh, in the book of Revelation, it speaks of the, the Jewish people being persecuted specifically. The temple is going to come under persecution. Temple worship will be stopped. The Jewish people are going to have to flee, it says in Revelation 11 and 12. And then in the book of Daniel, God tells Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, that 70 weeks, that is, this prediction, is for your people and for your city. Daniel's people were the Jewish people, Israel. His city was the city of Jerusalem. So the focus is, is on Israel. That's going to be the focus in the last days. God loves everybody. We're all going to be saved. We're all going to be equal inheritors, but still the focus is going to move to Israel with these particular events. And then both Daniel and Revelation speak of the judgment of a Christ-rejecting world. Now, what you find in the book of John is a period of time, all of those trumpets and seals and bowls and everything, those are called the wrath of God. And they the wrath of God upon the nations of this, of this world. The Old Testament prophets called that period the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord judgments and the, the wrath of God, this period is a judgment on the, uh, the nations who have rejected Jesus, Jesus Christ. And so God is going to judge individuals at the great white throne. But there will be a judgment upon planet Earth before Christ comes to, uh, to set up his kingdom and before the, the final judgment takes place. But there will be a judgment of the world's nations who have rejected Christ in time. It has a beginning and an end. It begins when Christ starts opening those scrolls, opening that six-sealed scroll, and it ends over in Revelation 6, 16 through 17, where it says, or excuse me, Revelation 15, 1, then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. So the wrath of God begins when Christ begins to pour out judgments as he opens the scroll, but it ends with those last judgments that come from 
the scroll. When they are finished, the bowl judgment. So that wrath of God on the nations ends. Christ comes, sets up his kingdom, and then the great white throne judgment of individuals is later and hell is later. So the judgment that we see here in the wrath of God, these judgments being poured out, it's not the eternal judgment, but it is the judgment on planet earth. And then just in the two minutes that we have left, I will mention that both Daniel and Revelation tell of an evil world ruler who is coming. This ruler is future. We know he's future because he is judged at Christ's coming in the book of Daniel and also in the book of Revelation. Daniel and Revelation use the term beast to describe him and his empire. And you can look at all these references. Third, this evil king will be powerful. Daniel talks about this, and Revelation specifically says that he, his power will come from the dragon. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And the scripture in 12.9 of Revelation says the dragon is a figure for the devil or for Satan. So don't underestimate the power of this evil king who's going to come. By the way, his most famous name, John gave it to him over in 1 John 2.18, and that is the Antichrist. The eschatological Antichrist is going to come. He will be empowered by Satan and have incredible power. He'll deceive the world. And then Daniel and Revelation tell us that his empire will consist of ten parts or ten nations. It will come from the sea, and the sea is, is, is uh, identified in Daniel and Revelation as the nations, the world of nations, the sea of nations. So it come out of the chaos of the nations. And his empire will also be centered in Rome, by the way. And then fifth, the Antichrist will be an atheist who will blaspheme God. It says in Daniel chapter 11, he shall pay attention to no God, for he shall magnify himself above all. And Revelation speaks of his blasphemy against God. And then Daniel and Revelation warn us that the evil king will persecute believers. So persecute believers, and that will be, um, I have a lot of scripture references for that. And then both Daniel and Revelation teach that this evil king will be destroyed at Christ's coming. And then number eight, wage war. That's the blank. Number nine, he's going to be doomed. He is going to be, the scripture says, that he will be captured, thrown into the lake of fire when Christ comes. And then we'll just fill in the blanks for the last two. Both Daniel and Revelation teach the resurrection of the saints will take place at Christ's return. Daniel 12, 2, it said people who sleep in the dust will wake up. They're going to be resurrected when Christ comes. And then in chapter 20 of Revelation, it says that these people who have died are going to live and they're going to rule and reign with Christ. And finally, both Daniel and Revelation teach that Christ is coming to deliver his saints. And so you can look at the scripture references there. Okay, well, it is 631, so I'm one minute over. And, uh, but a uh, it, lot, lot there, you know, a lot of stuff there. But it's good to see you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for your goodness. And thank you for these two wonderful books. And I uh, know just uh, wasn't able to do justice to, to the, uh, both of them tonight, but they're wonderful and look forward to the study of Revelation with Brother Mark. Thank you for all these people here. Pray that you'd bless them and give them a wonderful evening and a wonderful week in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.